Hello everyone. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. In this video, we shall be looking into some of the best practices that will help us build great microservices. In my previous video tutorial, I had explained what microservices are and what are the advantages of using a microservices architecture over a monolithic architecture. If you have not seen that video, I recommend you to see that before the current one. You can find the link to that video tutorial in the description below. Before moving into the best practices, we first need to understand what do microservices give us or what do we expect them to do. We shall then move to best practices in order to know how can we achieve these expectations in the best possible manner. The very first, we should be able to develop a microservice in a language of our own choice. Like suppose that I want to create two services, one in Java and the other in Python. So while developing these microservices, there shouldn't be any restriction on choosing a programming language. Second, we should be able to release it or deploy it as per our requirements. There shouldn't be any dependency on any other microservice. Third, we should be able to scale a microservice up or down as and when needed. And when doing this, there should not be any dependency on any other microservice. Fourth, in an organization, there are different teams. Each team could be a manager of a particular microservice. When a team works on their microservice, there should not be any dependency on any other team, which is managing some other microservice. Fifth, in case suddenly a microservice fails, it should not have any impact on any other microservice. The other microservices should be up and running. Now, you might have a question that why am I telling you about these expectations? This is because when building a microservice, we might end up with an architecture that is not up to the required performance mark or not able to deliver the expectations stated above. Let's take an example. I would like to show you what does a bad microservices architecture look like. Let's take a look at this diagram here. Now, the problem with this system is that this system is very difficult to maintain. Why? Because it requires a lot of coordination with multiple teams to make changes, make releases or achieve fault tolerance. In order to save yourself from getting into such complex situations, you can follow some of the best practices when building a microservice. These best practices and design principles will help you build microservices that are loosely coupled, distributed and optimized to deliver the best value. The very first best practice is to follow the single responsibility principle. In very short and simple, the single responsibility principle states that a class should only have a single reason to change. This principle is generally used when writing code, but this principle can also be used with microservices. Let us take an example. Let's say you are building microservices for ordering a pizza. You can consider building the following components based on the functionalities each supports like the inventory service, order service, payment service, user profile service, delivery notification service, etc. The inventory service would only have APIs that fetch or update the inventory of pizzas. The order service would only have APIs for creating orders. Likewise, others would carry the APIs for their functionality. None of the functionalities of the microservices should be in common with any other microservice. Our next best practice is 
separate data stores for our microservice. It defeats the purpose of having microservices if you are having a monolithic database that all or your microservices share. Any change or downtime to that database would then impact all the microservices that use the database. Therefore, you must choose the right database for your microservices needs, customize the infrastructure and storage to the data that it maintains and let it be exclusive to your microservice. Ideally, any other microservice that needs access to that data would only access it through the APIs that the microservice has exposed. Our next best practice is using asynchronous communication to achieve loose coupling. To avoid building a mesh of tightly coupled components, we should consider using asynchronous communication between microservices. Let's take an example. Let's say you have an order service that calls the inventory service. Once the inventory service returns a response, the order service returns success to the actor. If the actor is not interested in the inventory services output, then the order service can asynchronously invoke the inventory service and instantly respond with a success to the actor. An even better option is to use events for communicating between the microservices. Your microservice would publish an event to a message bus either indicating a state change or a failure and whichever microservice is interested in that event would pick it up and process it. Let's take an example. In the pizza order system above, sending a notification to the customer once their order is captured or status messages as the order gets fulfilled and delivered can happen using asynchronous communication. A notification service can listen to an event that an order has been submitted and process the notification to the customer. Our next best practice is using a circuit breaker to achieve fault tolerance. If your microservice is dependent on another system to provide a response and that system takes forever to respond, your overall response SLS will be impacted. To avoid this scenario and quickly respond, one simple microservices best practice you can follow is to use a circuit breaker to time out the external call and return a default response or an error. This will isolate the failing services that your service is dependent on without causing cascade failures, keeping your microservices in good health. Our next best practice is to proxy your microservice request through an API gateway. Instead of every microservice in the system performing the functions of API authentication, request or response logging, and throttling, having an API gateway doing these for you upfront will add a lot of value. Clients calling your microservices will connect to the API gateway instead of directly calling your service. This way, you will avoid all those additional calls from your microservice and the internal URLs of your service would be hidden, giving you the flexibility to redirect the traffic from the API gateway to a newer version of your service. This is even more ne necessary when a third party is accessing your service as you can throttle the incoming traffic and reject unauthorized requests from the API gateway before they reach your microservice. You can also choose to have a separate API gateway that accepts traffic from external networks. Last but not the least, we have versioning our microservices for breaking changes. It's not always possible to make backward compatible changes. When you are making a breaking change, expose a new version of your endpoint 
while continuing to support older versions. Consumers can choose to use the new, new version at their convenience. However, having too many versions of your API can create a nightmare for those maintaining the code. Hence, have a disciplined approach to deprecate older versions by working with your clients or internally rerouting the traffic to the newer versions. So friends, these were a few microservices best practices that we can follow to achieve great performance. By following these microservices best practices, you should end up with a loosely coupled, distributed and independent microservices system, wherein you can achieve the true benefits of a microservices architecture as listed at the beginning of this video.